In July 2021, Kasai Al Jundi posted several TikTok videos of himself dancing in the driveway of a $1.6 million home in London. In the videos, he was wearing expensive new clothes. His friend, Mohammed El Aboud, joined in and filmed himself showing off the three bedroom house as though it were his own. But it wasn't their house and the two men had just murdered the house's owner the day before. Kasai Al-Jundi wanted everyone to think he was wealthy and living an extravagant lifestyle. However, the truth was he was flat broke and needed to find a way to make himself rich. Al-Jundi was a cook at a kebab shop who'd befriended Louise Cam, a wealthy businesswoman in her 70s who owned multiple properties in the area. Mohammed El Aboud was a delivery driver who had recently arrived in the UK. Like most things on TikTok, the lifestyle videos the men posted were not reality. The property they were filming was not theirs, but instead belonged to Cam. Surveillance footage caught the pair leaving the kebab shop where Al Jundi worked carrying a stack of cleaning products. More footage with El Aboud moving Cam's BMW out of her driveway surfaced. Al Jundi and El Aboud had met Cam at her rental property in North London under the pretense they were going to buy the house. Cam arrived in her BMW expecting a lawyer to be present to finalize the sale as Al Jundi convinced her he would be paying for the house in cash. But there was no lawyer present when she arrived, so Cam refused to go through with the sale without one. Al Jundi and El Aboud then overpowered her and forced her to sign over her power of attorney. The exchange turned deadly when one of the men attacked her from behind, ending her life. Cam's son reported Louise missing in July 2021. Her family had been concerned about strange text messages from Louise's phone claiming that she had unexpectedly returned to China. Cam's son knew the texts weren't written the way his mother spoke, and he didn't understand why she would abruptly leave without telling anybody. Al Jundi was the one contacting them, trying to cover up his and Ella Boud's actions. However, the pair couldn't resist the temptation to flaunt Cam's expensive home on social media. Police searched for Cam, but their hopes of finding her alive ended when they eventually discovered her body in a trash can. At that point, the missing person's inquiry turned into a homicide investigation. Al Jundi and El Aboud had tried to make it look like Cam had left the country, but the videos of them at her home were too incriminating for the authorities to ignore. Al Jundi thought he would be able to sign over all of Cam's wealth to himself through the power of attorney, including her two properties. He thought their crimes would make him rich and lured El Aboud in by promising him a share if he helped commit the deed. According to Al Jundi, Jundi's social media presence, he was a millionaire with a string of beautiful girlfriends. However, the truth was that he was a broke hook working in a kebab shop and had a wife and three children. Louise Cam also wasn't the first woman he'd con. He would charm his victims by convincing them he was in love with them. And once Al Jundi had their trust, he would take what he could. One of his victims was in her 60s, and after declaring his undying love for her, he stole her two cars. Al Jundi fed Cam the same lines, telling her he was in love with her with the hopes he would sign over the properties to him. He spent months building a relationship with his victim until she completely trusted him. It was a trust that cost her her life. Cam was divorced and owned a business property and several apartments near Al Jundi's restaurant. She owned those properties outright, but had a mortgage on the home she thought Al Jundi was going to buy from her. Al Jundi offered her $7.3 million for her properties, which was above the market value, making the offer too sweet to pass up. She wanted to sell so that she could give the money to her children. Al Jundi told Cam his backer was a woman named Anna. Cam even received voice note messages that she believed were from Anna. The Anna, Al Jundi referred to was Anna Wright, another victim in his romance scams and a customer at his restaurant. Al Jundi would send her messages proclaiming his undying love for her and claiming that there was nobody else in his life but her. Reich later admitted to being psychologically manipulated by the fraudster. Reich had eventually agreed to sell him her Toyota RAV4 and Audi TT, which were worth around $70,000. She handed the cars over to Al Jundi, but he never gave her a penny. Reich planned on ending all contact with him once she had the money, but he always managed to avoid 
made any kind of payment. Al Jundi now needed Reich to be a part of his operation against Cam, but when he asked her to attend meetings as an interpreter, she refused. Cam was so convinced Al Jundi was going to buy her rental property that she had already given him the keys. Al Jundi handed them over to El Aboud so he could move in. Al Jundi promised El Aboud a fortune and enticed him by letting him have Reich's Audi TT. At the time, El Aboud had only been in the UK for a few months and didn't yet have a work visa. He was working as a delivery driver and a warehouse worker for Disney, so the opportunity to acquire a new car and a nice place to live was a no-brainer. During their trial, El Aboud had claimed Al Jundi tricked him. He claimed Al Jundi told him that if El Aboud got rid of Cam, he would get a share of the money. Al Jundi's actual girlfriend was a Romanian model named Maria Amaruke. She was dating him at the time of the crime and was at the house with Al Jundi and El Aboud the day they met with Cam. Al Jundi celebrated his unspeakable actions by taking Amerikwai to a jeweler and buying her $700 earrings within hours of the crime. The shopping trip wasn't just about treating his girlfriend. Al Jundi needed an alibi, and receipts from their transactions and surveillance camera footage would give him that. When El Aboud drove his girlfriend home that night, he confessed to her what he'd done to Cam. He explained it was over a business disagreement between Al Jundi and Cam, and he couldn't believe what they'd done. El Aboud claimed to her that Al Jundi made him commit the crime. Cam's family grew more and more concerned when they didn't hear from her. Al Jundi had kept Cam's cell phone and bank cards to make it seem like she was still alive, furthering the confusion. Al Jundi sent them messages from her phone, pretending to be Cam, and said she had decided to go back to China. Her family members responded with questions that went unanswered and were left with no clue as to what had actually happened to her. Al Jundi also sold Cam's car to unsuspecting buyers and used the proceeds to buy new clothes. Al Jundi then filmed his videos for TikTok, where he danced in Cam's driveway, pretending her house was his own and showing no remorse for his or El Aboud's action. Together, Al Jundi and El Aboud moved Cam into a trash can that Al Jundi arranged to have delivered to his family home. Party ended three days later when police found Cam's lifeless body at Al Jundi's house. The pair planned for it to be picked up by a garbage truck and taken to a landfill where it probably would have never been recovered, making it nearly impossible for the crime to be traced back to them. But the body was found, and authorities promptly arrested Al Jundi and El Aboud. Both denied their involvement in Cam's death, despite last being seen alive on a video feed entering the North London property where she was ambushed. There was no footage of her ever leaving the house. With El Aboud living at the house and Al Jundi arriving shortly after Cam, they were clearly involved. During their trial, the prosecution accused them of preying on an older woman in an attempt to plunder her life savings. Prosecution highlighted how Al Jundi deceived Cam by making her believe he would pay her huge sums of money in exchange for her properties. He forced her into signing paperwork connected to the sale and manipulated her to have her sign a power of attorney form that could have left him in control of her finances. When he texted her relatives to say she'd moved to China after selling some of her properties, they knew something was wrong. None of them ever believed they were speaking to Cam. Some of Cam's friends questioned Al Jundi about where she was, to which he claimed she had deceived him and left the country with his money. Al Jundi further alleged that Cam had defrauded him of close to $16 million. The prosecution quickly dismissed his accusations as Al Jundi had barely any money in his account, and since he worked as a cook at a kebab shop, he clearly didn't have millions of dollars to steal. Both defendants spoke through Arabic translators, though it was clear from the nature of his actions that Al Jundi spoke fluent English. Al Jundi blamed El Aboud, saying he was the one that committed the deed, and asked Al Jundi to help him with the cover-up. Amiraquai also testified that El Aboud had confessed to her that he was the one who committed the act. However, when El Aboud took the witness box, he told a very different story. He told the court he was sick the day of the crime and was asleep in an upstairs bedroom. According to him, he didn't wake up until after Al Jundi and his girlfriend left. Supposedly, when El Aboud went downstairs to find Cam lying in the living room, he was so shocked and frightened, he burst into tears. He claimed Al Jundi called him and El Aboud demanded to know what he had done to the woman. El Aboud testified he threatened to go to the police, but Al Jundi shouted at him he could barely speak English and had no home, money, or family in the UK. Ameriquai contradicted his statements and said she never heard any shouting as she was present during the conversation. She also denied the nature of her relationship with Al Jundi, claiming they were not romantically involved. Ameriquai knew Al Jundi was attracted to her and told her he wanted to get married and have children together, though she wasn't as interested in that kind of future with him. She referred to him as her king and faced accusations in court that she led him on because she thought he had money. Ameriquai was staying at the house on the ill-fated day when Cam entered to complete a business transaction. She claimed she had seen Cam in the living room, sitting on a sofa, before she left that day with Al Jundi. Despite their
their best attempts at incriminating one another, neither man could escape justice. The court found them both guilty of ending the life of 71-year-old Louise Cam, and each received a life sentence in prison with a minimum term of 35 years. Al Jundi and El Aboud still denied their involvement in what happened to Cam, even after they were both convicted. Love him or hate him, it's clear that former U.S. President Donald Trump rewrote the rules regarding how a commander-in-chief should behave in the White House. For Lawrence Luau Malong Yor Jr., Trump was a role model in his pursuit of riches and political power. Lawrence is the stepson of a former military leader in South Sudan and claimed that he made billions of dollars on his own even though most of the country's residents live in extreme poverty. Even as the nation remained involved in seemingly endless war and struggled to provide enough food for its population, Lawrence flaunted his wealth in some flashy ways. At one point, he uploaded a video to Facebook that showed him tossing around $100 bills strewn across a bed. He indicated that the total amount of cash topped $1 million and described his location being at a presidential suite at an expensive hotel. However, he did not specify what city he was in. Aside from merely showing off his cash collection, Lawrence, or Young Tycoon as he calls himself, insisted that he was a generous philanthropist. He said he donated millions of dollars to organizations including the Red Cross in Kenya and South Sudan. Among the other recipients of seven-figure donations, he claimed, were churches across the region. Of course, representatives of these groups provided an entirely different story. John Mayom of the South Sudan Red Cross asserted that he knew nothing of any such donation, saying they were following up on this misleading and malicious claim. As for conspicuous consumption and shameless display of wealth, Lawrence made it clear that he didn't think it was so wrong. In fact, he described himself as a die-hard Trump supporter and pointed to the former president as a shiny example of someone who's not ashamed of his massive bank account. Calling his hero the world's greatest president and the world's greatest man, Lawrence said that Trump is, quote, someone who likes to show off that he's rich. In that respect, Lawrence said the two men have something in common, believing he's just like the Donald. Before exploring the scope of his daring scheme, let's look at Lawrence's background and the events that led him to a life of luxury at the expense of his suffering countrymen. As the stepson of a mighty army general with close ties to South Sudan President Salva Kiir, Lawrence was given plenty of opportunities to skim money out of the government's coffers to fund his lavish spending habits. Nevertheless, he repeatedly assured critics that his immense wealth was in no way due to his family's political connections. Instead, he attempted to portray himself as a brilliant entrepreneur who was able to amass a fortune based only on his own intelligence and hard work. That depiction of himself seemed unbelievable on its face since he had no known background in business. His behavior raised plenty of red flags, but he wasn't the first in his influential family to face severe accusations of wrongdoing. His stepfather, Paul Malong Awan, served as the military's chief of staff and allegedly used his position to carry out atrocities of all types. In in addition to commanding the military to commit brutal and violent acts, the United Nations claimed that the general also forced children to fight alongside adults in the army throughout a years-long civil war. Lawrence was born in 1988 and his mother married Malong a few years later after his biological father's passing. This set the boy up for a privileged life with a nation that offered few opportunities to rise out of crippling poverty. His family moved away during his childhood, but he was considered a member of South Sudan's elite upon moving back. In addition to posing for photos with the president and other top officials, Lawrence was given the cushy government job of reaching out to foreign investors interested in launching diamond, gold, or oil excavation efforts. His position allowed him to travel around the world on the government's dime while adding expensive new items to his massive collection of luxury toys. Despite presenting himself as a billionaire tycoon, Lawrence simultaneously crafted the persona of a selfless public servant. He claimed that all of his efforts to make himself rich were also part of a plan to bring new jobs into South Sudan. While the nation sank deeper into the grips of war, Lawrence insisted that he only wanted 
to allow the citizens to lay down their weapons and earn an honest living. As it turns out, there wasn't much about his behavior that could be described as honest. He repeatedly denied accusations that he only got rich because of his family's connections. Instead, he said he was, quote, blessed by Jesus Christ and promised ordinary citizens they could reach the same level of success. At one point, Lawrence insisted that his family name didn't make any difference. He was a businessman, and that's all there was to it. Although he tried to paint himself as a savior for the citizens of South Sudan, his social media presence offered a different perspective. He posted Facebook pictures and videos that showed him next to private jets, luxury vehicles, and almost any other conceivable symbol of extreme wealth. Lawrence insisted that he didn't use his Facebook profile to flaunt his money and possessions when confronted with the apparent inconsistency. He didn't want to be a wealthy man, he just wanted to help his people through his Facebook. Wow, how noble. He often referred to himself using some favorite nicknames along with his staged social media posts. In addition to frequently calling himself Young Tycoon, Lawrence also posted a picture of himself flying first class and referred to himself as Smart Boy for Life. Flying business class, or coach, he argued, would negatively impact his ability to attract high rolling investors. Flying economy wouldn't attract the people he needed to win over. Therefore, it's first class or nothing. While he was living the life of a pampered globetrotter, the people back home in South Sudan were embroiled in a disastrous military conflict and a lack of necessities, including food and clean water. A thorough investigation discovered how much climate change was impacting the people. Desert regions have grown hotter and more inhospitable in recent years, which has caused countless people to move away from the areas they called home their entire lives. The violence that has dominated much of the country throughout a period of internal strife has contributed to the displacement of even more South Sudanese individuals and families. The brutal civil war dates back to 2013, shortly after the country declared independence from Sudan and became the newest official nation on Earth. Earth. Before that, Sudan had been embroiled in its own violent conflict for generations. Many of the brutal practices that were common in Sudan were also upheld by the leaders of South Sudan. The regime extinguished dozens of prisoners and hundreds more were sentenced to capital punishment under the country's strict legal system. To make matters worse, the nation was secretive about how it handled executions, so there were probably some forms of capital punishment carried out without being reported. Some children were reportedly handed down extreme sentences during the nation's extended period of fear and turmoil. Hundreds of thousands of people were taken out over six years as military leaders who backed the nation's president squared off against those who sided with former Vice President Riek Makar. With adequate health care and clean water and short supply, much of the nation has grown accustomed to living in reprehensible conditions. The vicious cycle of poverty is made even worse because nearly three in four South Sudanese citizens are believed to be illiterate. Things became so bad in this troubled nation that an organization with ties to George Clooney took an interest in exposing the situation to the rest of the world. He co-founded The Century, which performed a deep analysis of what had gone wrong in South Sudan and what other countries could do to help. Following the eye-popping results of that probe, Clooney warned nations worldwide that the unrest in South Sudan could soon expand to impact other regions of the planet. He said that people should care not just because it's the right thing to do, but because at one point or another, it's something that everyone will be dealing with. The group's report determined that a corrupt network at the helm of South Sudan's government has been responsible for defrauding the struggling citizens of the nation out of what little money they had. Although Lawrence was the flashy big spender, his stepfather father was really wreaking havoc behind the scenes. Malong was the governor of the northern Bar El Ghazal region between 2008 and 2014, but when he took over as a prominent military leader, his behavior triggered some red flags. He was the top officer in the South Sudan People's Defense Forces until May 2017. During that time, he served as a personal advisor to the president and allegedly orchestrated a series of war crimes. Dating back to 2013, two militia groups carried out a slew of executions with the apparent goal of protecting the president and Malong. Reports of the atrocities captured the attention of the United States, which tried and failed to impose sanctions against the general and other high-ranking officials. As the Sentry determined in its report, Malong also collected a range of luxury possessions and extravagant residences in Uganda throughout this period. One spacious home was built within a fortress and boasted a 7,000 square foot floor plan. A second villa was about 6,000 square feet of space, built in an exclusive Bungu community. In addition, in addition to his government salary, Malong and his close relatives maintained a financial interest in various international firms. President Kier has also courted controversy through his alarming actions and conspicuous displays.
displays of wealth. Although his salary as president was a mere $60,000 per year, investigations found that he had amassed a fortune in other countries. Furthermore, his relatives were living in luxury and escaped the brutality and poverty affecting citizens in every corner of South Sudan. Close relatives of the president were tied to scams and schemes that allowed them to profit off the civil war while bringing more uncertainty and food insecurity to the nation. Kier funded a sprawling ranch where he was free to store a range of weapons and other military gear that he bought with all his ill-gotten riches. There were even attack helicopters found at the ranch, leading to concerns that the unhinged president might turn his cache of weapons against the citizens he was supposed to be leading. While some corrupt political and military leaders can escape justice based on their financial assets and influential connections, Lawrence was finally brought to justice in 2021. He was eventually charged with a scam he perpetrated with a pair of accomplices. Prosecutors determined that the three scammers convinced a pair of foreign investors to sink their money into a fraudulent gold business in Uganda. As large sums of money moved through accounts based in multiple countries, evidence showed that the scam brought in more than $1 million. He was convicted on multiple counts, including conspiracy, obtaining money through false pretenses, and making false claims. At his sentencing, Lawrence learned he would spend six years behind bars for his involvement in the scheme. Although it might seem as though justice was paid in this case, plenty more work must be done to reduce the corruption and crime that continues to leave the South Sudanese people living in fear and poverty. Click to watch one of these next videos and let us know in the comment section who is the one politician you hate the most.